Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation. And today we have got the inevitable task of ranking the top five Iron Maiden songs of all time. And my co-host is Reed Little. G'day, Reed. How are you going? Up the irons. Absolutely. I am doing great, Peter. How, how are things down under? No, not a doing well, doing well. Look, this is a really tough one. So we're going to rank it from um, five to one, and maybe we'll sneak a couple of sneaky, uh, you know, honourable mentions as well. So Reed, far away, let's hear your number five. Okay, so let's start off. I am an old school Iron Maiden fan. Now the very first two albums were import only in the United States. And uh, they were probably easily available on the coast, but in Montana, I didn't know anybody who had those albums. I'd never even seen them. So the first album that I was aware of was Number of the Beast. And the first album that anybody I knew owned uh, was Peace of Mind. So really my introduction to Iron Maiden came with Peace of Mind and then the videos for, they had Run to the Hills, I think was probably the first uh, video of theirs that I saw. So yep. I've been listening to Iron Maiden more or less since 1982. Um, and I'll get into when uh, Iron Maiden transformed from just another band I listened to to one of my favorite bands. And uh, Iron Maiden, I do consider them to be one of my top all-time bands. So I'm going to uh, raise a few eyebrows with this one, especially uh, with some, uh, some chat that Peter and I were having before we rolled cameras. My number five song comes off of their latest album, Sinjutsu. Oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and it is, in fact, the title track, Sinjutsu. Right. So Iron Maiden, for most of their career, with a few notable departures, they have stayed within lanes. You know, they, they have two primary styles of songs they do. They have the short, punchy song like Run to the Hills, and they have the seven-minute epic song like Hallowed Be Thy Name. And for their entire career, they have more or less done one of those two styles of songs. So I think we should celebrate when they do something different successfully. And really, the most recent thing that they did that was different prior to this was the acoustic Journeyman song off of Dance of Death, which is a good song, but not, not one of my favorites. But Sinjutsu, it hooked me in right from the start with those war drums, the, the kind of pseudo taiko drumming. And I'm not a big drum guy. I've said that on other chats. So when I notice the drums, it's got to be something very different. And it has this story to it. It's kind of this pan-Asian pseudo fantasy. Uh, you know, the Japanese weren't famous wall builders. So that comes from mainland Asia. Um, but it, it tells this story. And I love with um, Somewhere in Time, Iron Maiden added a third style of music. And that was kind of the soundtrack of the imagination. And for me, Sinjutsu is a soundtrack of the imagination song. So you've got this invasion happening. Probably the Mongols, right? That's, that's who invaded everybody back in, you know, 5600 ADE. Um, and the, the rallying around to the call and all of that. I mean, it's great. And it's if, if you weren't listening to the videos, and I tried to avoid the videos before the album came out because the sound is so horrible on them. Yeah. Um, I wanted to wait for the CD to really listen to it. So this was your first time to hear what Bruce is going to sound like post-cancer. Um, and he sounds great. He sounds different. Unquestionably, he sounds different. The man lost a golf ball sized piece of his tongue. There's no way he wasn't going to sound a little bit different, but he still sounds phenomenal. And I think that his new vocal sound fit in with that song. So um, I loved it. Even though it's 10 seconds longer than my limit for uh, most Iron Maiden songs, I think that eight minutes is their limit for great songs. And this one's eight minutes and 10 seconds. But number five is Sinjutsu. Well, I didn't expect that. Um, oh, well, yeah, there you go. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the album. Um, I think a lot of it is very mid-paced and it doesn't sort of, um, you know, sort of gravitate to me for some reason. I've listened to that album um, many, many times, but it just 
maybe the penny just hasn't um, dropped on that one. But anyway, yeah, there you go. My number five is Iron Maiden by Iron Maiden. Oh, okay. So that's their traditional closer in the concerts. Um, Paul Diano, Clive Burr, you've got the lineup behind me. Um, I think the thing about this, uh, the early lineup, and I know Steve Harris is very anti-punk. There is a punk influence in that those first couple of Iron Maiden albums. Everybody but Steve Harris acknowledges that. Absolutely. And it's probably um, like Paul Diano was an ex-skinhead. Um, he's ha had a very rough life. Um, even the lyrics of Iron Maiden, it's about running wild and running free. Um, it's, there's a lot of punk ethos. It's, it's a lot of urgency. The playing on that song is there's a lot of fire in the belly read. Um, I think it's, you know, it's undeniable there is a punk influence in, in that, those early Iron Maiden albums, which Steve Harris says, oh, I hate punk, because punk is a lot of the do-it-yourself, where um, metal is much more, you know, precise, and, and there's a lot of musicianship um, right. in his way of uh, thinking. So, but anyway, that's my number five. I've always liked the Iron Maiden by Iron Maiden, the original version. And I even like uh, how uh, Dicko, you know, um, has included that in the, the song list, um, you know, when he took over, you know, the lead vocals right to now. So that's my number five, Iron Maiden by Iron Maiden. Yeah, excellent. Okay, and uh, I assure anybody who watches this, uh, I have not made my picks just to be difficult. I simply have a very deep experience with Iron Maiden and perhaps after, my goodness, 40 years of listening to them, uh, you know, what I get out of the songs is maybe not the same thing I did when I was 13, right? So my number four pick is going to be my most traditional pick. People might be surprised to see this one uh, so low on the list, but it's off of Number of the Beast, and it's Hallowed Be Thy Name. So I think Hallowed Be Thy Name is the Iron Maiden song. If anybody has never heard Iron Maiden, you can play that song for them, and it is everything that Iron Maiden is. The length of it, it's kind of epic. It's got the, the galloping guitars, but not just the sound of it, you've also got Steve Harris's lyrics about death and potential reincarnation, um, which is a theme he would go to, ironically, again and again uh, in the songs that he writes for the band. It really, I think it represents Iron Maiden possibly even better than the song Iron Maiden. Uh, and much like the song Iron Maiden, they still do it in every show. But it really, to me, represents that change from that youthful, punky energy to, okay, now we're a more mature band. They've done world tours. This is their third album. They've got a new singer. And now they're really bringing the musicianship. Their songwriting has tightened up and they just go for it. And I think it's the perfect Iron Maiden track, but I'm only putting it at number four. Mm. Interesting. Well, I I love that album. That was their big breakthrough album worldwide, and especially in my turf of Australia. And um, I'll talk more about that um, more about that later. My number four is off the Peace of Mind album, which is arguably one of their best, easily top three, and it's the Trooper. Very timely in this sort of the. Th the stuff that's happening in the world um you know it's a meditation of um warfare and the mindset of uh somebody going into war it's got all the classic um iron maiden type of uh, elements you've got the the leather lung bruce dickinson just singing the galloping bass lines and the intricate weaving um you know sort of guitar lines between um smith and murray I love it. I think it's great. And another thing that I really love about the I early Iron Maiden albums, Reed, and I think is completely underrated. And, you know, I've been just picking up on this because I, when I prepared for this show, I was playing all the, the Iron Maiden discography. Clive Burr, what a drummer. 
he had, I know you're not a drum guy, but I tell you what, his drumming, um, the little fills, he was in the pocket all the time, little grooves and, and, and drumming. And um, you read the, the history of Iron Maiden, a bit of a mystery why he left the band. I know his father passed away and um, he, he left the band and then, you know, they got um, Nico in and, you know, the rest is history. But I, I think if you listen to those early our Iron Maiden albums, there's a lot of groove and he just really drives those songs along. And, um, you know, a lot of the drum fills, the really intricate drum fills, they really sort of add an extra element um, to those Iron Maiden songs. But anyway, yeah. that's my number four, The Trooper. And again, that's a, a, a concert staple. Um, every, I mean, I've seen Iron Maiden last four times and that's always in the song set. And it's one of their concert staples to this day. Uh, Yannick Garris tells the story of when he auditioned for Iron Maiden, although his, his joining the band was kind of, forgive my French, fait accompli. Mm. Um, but he says that when he went to try out for the band, he and Dave Murray plugged into amplifiers and faced each other and didn't really know what to do. So Yannick just started playing the beginning lick of the Trooper and you know, the rest is history. And uh, let me also say this, people, I don't know why Yannick Garris gets the hate he does. I think he's a good guitarist. I think he's an incredibly entertaining guitarist. Um, and whether or not he's as good live as he is on album, he plays a lot of the solos on albums. And I don't think his solos are bad. I mean, I think he's a good guitarist. So well, it, it surprised I... me to see the hate that man gets. Yeah, I'm. I was familiar with uh, Yannick Gears from Gillen, the yes. Double Trouble um, album, uh, Gillen Magic, um, and he was copying heat then as being a Richie Blackmore clone. Um, but I think he's got a good tone. He does some tasteful licks. I think the thing that brings a lot of hate is his stage presence. So you've seen them many times. He does the ballerina type of routine. He does the throwing of the guitar up in the air. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening in an Iron Maiden live concert. And, you know, and I think a lot of people get quite distracted by the Yannick Gears stage presence. And I think that's why it brings a lot of hate. But um, it's been a constant uh, source of uh, internet debate of how good Yannick Gears is he surplus to the needs of the band um what does he add um he is definitely a, a controversial topic just type in yannick gears on the internet and you'll see uh, the the typical responses read yeah no doubt but you know what he's a he's written a lot of songs since he joined um well i i can't speak to uh uh x factor or virtual 11 because I listened to X Factor one time and threw it away. It's the only CD I've ever actually literally thrown away. I played it one time, pulled it out of my disc player and threw it away. It wasn't even worth taking to the used CD store. I hated that disc. And I didn't bother with Virtual Eleven. So I don't know what songs he did for there. Um, but beyond that, I thought he, thought he was an excellent one. Okay. But let's move to my number three pick is off of my contrarian pick for best Iron Maiden CD of all time, and that is Stranger and, or excuse me, Somewhere in Time. I like that. I love oh. this CD. And the thing I said, up until this point, Iron Maiden had a lot of songs that I liked, but their, their albums didn't really hook me in. I think Power Slave is a highly overrated album. I think it has some great songs on it, but it has some absolute filler on it too. Um, that, and I don't particularly care for Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. I know everyone, when that song came out, everyone's like, oh, it's, it's like a literary theme. And I'm like, yeah, and then it's got that really long, boring section in it where Bruce gets to exercise his literature reading degree. Um, and I, I know Bruce is into the themes of it and, God forbid, I'm a college professor. I want kids to read, but that song just bores me. I'm sorry, it does. This album though, this is the one where they switched to what I was saying, the soundtrack of the mind. They experimented with soundscapes on this. They were inspired by the movie Blade Runner. And 
if you take away the lyrics, because the lyrics are kind of standard Iron Maiden lyrics to a point, again, those themes of death and reincarnation uh, that Steve Harris likes so much, um, this could be the, an alternate soundtrack for Blade Runner. But the song that I chose as my favorite is Stranger in a Strange Land. There are a couple of others that I could have gone with. Yeah. And clearly, Wasted Years is the one that they still do in concert. But Stranger in a Strange Land is such a fantastic song, and it opens with that bass line. Uh, and how many Iron Maiden songs actually open with naked bass? And then it's got that wonderful sci-fi story that ends in a tragedy. The guy oh. dies alone on this planet. Um, it's yeah. a very affecting song. Uh, Adrian Smith was unhappy and thinking of leaving the band. And I think he channels that angst into this song. And I love it. I think it's a phenomenal song. Um, yeah. And it has stuck with me for years from the first time I heard it. Yeah, well done. Well, Strange Thing Read. That's one of my favorite Iron Maiden albums, but none of them have made my top five. It's just, that's one of those, um, I mean, when you're doing a top five Iron Maiden, which is a tough assignment in the best of times, um, yeah, very hard. Um, but I really like that album a lot. And I have to say on an aesthetic level, the album cover is probably one of the best album covers. I remember when I got that, when I um, it first came out and I would just peruse the album cover. If you just look at this, just so much um, beautiful incre incremental sort of um, artwork. Um, Power Slave's a good album on the art cover side of it, but um, oh, I tell you what, Somewhere in Time really takes the cake. Um, and, and there are lengthy videos where people dissect every little image on that album mm. cover. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, for my number three, I'm going to take it off the album Power Slave, which is one of my favorite. So going contrary and a little bit to you, Reid. And off this album, I think that, uh, well, Iron Maiden have great album openers. Their side one and side two, there's always a pow. There's always a great opening track. And I think that, um, you know, Ace is High and Two Min Minutes to Midnight are one of the, the, the greatest one-two punches in um, heavy metal history, in my opinion. And I'm going to go with Two Minutes to Midnight. Again, very timely lyrics. Um, so it was written in a time in the 80s where everything was, you know, um, sort of around about no nukes there was the still a little bit of the edge of the cold war um gee times have sort of come back full circle again but anyway with two minutes to midnight great guitar riff really interesting lyrics and you know the lyrics of harris are always interesting um and i know you were saying about uh, the rhyme of the ancient mariner and um you know you know, it's a little bit of a history lesson, but you can't say he's a boring or uninspired lyricist. There's always something in there. Um, but yeah, I like the riffage of Two Minutes to Midnight. And um, yeah, that's my number three. So not surprisingly, that's another Adrian Smith song. I realized as I was going through this, four of my top five songs are Adrian Smith compositions, or at least co-compositions. Mm. He's the guy that really brought if you can think of hooks in an Iron Maiden song, it's almost certainly an Adrian Smith composition. Mm. Um, and we'll get to a variation on, on that theme here in, uh, in just a little bit. But, uh, oh, sorry, middle age, uh, middle age brain. I had a thought to go along with two minutes to midnight and it's gone. Maybe it'll come back to me later. That's all right. So um, my number two, Another Adrian Smith composition. This time I'm uh, very surprisingly sticking in the 21st century. So I'm going off of the album Dance of Death. Kind of a polarizing album when it came out. Some people liked it. Some people didn't like it. I don't care for a couple of songs on it. But there are some songs on it that I really like. And one of those is... Um, in, in my opinion, their greatest epic song, and that is Passchendaele. Uh, Passchendaele is another one that I won't really say it's different, but the fact that it opens with that 
solo guitar doing. I don't know what he's doing, the tapping. I don't think Adrian Smith taps. So I think he's actually uh, playing it uh, with his pick, the plectrum, for those of you who aren't in the US. Um, I don't know how he plays it, but um, what a wonderful line. And then mixing the, it comes in with the sudden assault of sound and then it backs back up and tells the story of one of the bloodiest battles of World War I. And nobody does that as well as Iron Maiden. And now uh, there are some bands like Sabaton, which has become, much to my surprise, one of the biggest bands in power metal. Uh, I've seen Sabaton live and I thought they were good. You know, didn't think they were all that. Didn't think they were worthy of being one of the biggest bands in power metal, but what do I know? But one of their things is, oh, we do all of these real world songs. Well, kids, Iron Maiden was doing that first. And frankly, I think they do that better. So that, that song is not only sonically, like I said, it has the loud, it has the soft. So it's contrasting, it's attacking you like charging the wall across no man's land. Mm -hmm. And it has an emotional punch. Yeah. So, yeah, love Absolutely. it. Oh, good choice, good choice. No, um, Maiden have been very good about, um, in their songs, re-dynamics. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about Maiden, the dynamics um, in respect of the, uh, you know, the intricacies between um, the guitarists. And um, yeah, that's a really good song. All right. Um, going to the business end, number two, again, Power Slave, Aces High. So this is one of the uh, highlights of the stage show, depending on what tour that you saw, where the, the bomber comes over, the bomber plane comes over and you've got the lights and... Um, yeah, I, I think, as I said, that's just a great opening um, to the, the Power Slave album. It's, it's thundering bass lines. It's uh, the guitar work. Um, really, really strong lyrics. And, um, yeah, I think uh, I, going through all the Iron Maiden albums, I think Ace is High and Two Minutes to Midnight is probably the opening, the, the best one-two punch out of any of the Iron Maiden albums as, a, as an, an opening track. And that's my number two. You know, and I used to feel the same way. I did. But something replaced it in my affections. No, what lowers Power Slave for me is, is a couple of the other songs. I don't think Back in the Village is particularly good. Or um, there are the two Bruce compositions back to back. Uh, and I'm spacing on the names of them right now. Flash of the Blade. Yeah, I, I like those. Um, deeper Cuts. Yeah. I yeah. like the drum, the drumming in, in some of those songs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I disagree. But anyway, that's all part of it. The um, So going back to my complete disdain for uh, the X Factor. Now, sadly, Iron Maiden had, let's be fair, dropped off considerably. Um, if you look at um, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, now it's considered a bit of a masterpiece. At the time, it kind of wasn't. Uh, it was very unfavorably compared to things like Queensryche's Operation Mind Crime uh, in terms of a concept heavy metal album. Um, and it, I mean, it did okay business, but it, it went to number I, one. I think, um, Reed, it, I don't know, maybe in the States, um, they yeah. may have dropped off, but in the UK, I believe that went to number one. Um, can I play with Madness? Um, I'm sure our viewers will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that went to number one or charted very high, but that album did pretty good business in UK and Europe, but maybe a drop off in America. It, it was definitely a drop off in America. And then they followed that up with No Prayer for the Dying, an album I like most of, but it mm. was really the first Iron Maiden album for me that I was like, okay, I like songs on this, but I don't like the whole album. And then Fear of the Dark was worse. There are a yeah. few songs on Fear of the Dark I like, but most of it I don't care for. You talk about mid-tempo and sort of singing. Yeah, well, funny you should say that because I was listening to Fear of the Dark um, recently and I was just thinking it's lost a lot of the guitar intricacies that we like, the guitar lines. A lot of it is chords, yes. like power chords. And I was thinking, gee, it's a lot of it's like um, ACDC. They were kind of going for a very simpler sound and it doesn't sound like Iron Maiden. So that's why I think that album gets heavily criticized. 
although there's a track on that album, which I might, I'll throw into an honourable mention um, that gets played a lot. But um, yeah, that album was quite a disappointing one. Going back to your point about, and I'm sorry, we're diverting around. For, your number one's coming up soon. It's all right. You know, it yeah. Builds up um, that's what we do. We just go down rabbit holes, viewers. <laughs> um, talking about the seventh um sign going down the gurgler in in the us do you think it's because speed metal your slayers your anthrax the big four that was the type of music that people were gravitating so you had a lot of the traditional iron maiden lovers and they were going for something that was harder faster heavier um different and that's why they lost um maybe in america a, a big portion of their audience size going down the metallica um anthrax megadeth slayer rabbit hole I don't know that it's specifically, I mean, yes, but I, I think it's kind of more general than that, right? Because in the early 80s, you had English metal in America. And then like the biggest American metal band, if you even can consider it that, was probably Dio. And Dio was half Europeans, right? Two Americans, two Europeans. So and then you had Ozzy, who he had an American guitar player. But the rest of the band, well, he had an Australian bass player and uh, maybe Lee Kerslake. No, he's from the UK. Anyway, so he had a multinational band. My point being, there wasn't really an iconic American metal band yet until Quiet Riot hit big with Come On, Feel the Noise, or cover of Come On, Feel the Noise. By the time Seventh Son of a Seventh Son came out, America had its own metal scene and it had diverted into two metal scenes. You had the LA metal scene. So you had your, your rats, your Motley Crues, and then hair metal is starting to come up with your poisons and your Cinderella's and your warrants. And then you had thrash. And at this point, thrash wasn't very big. Now it was there and it was hardcore. If you were into thrash at this point, man, you were hardcore, but they were not selling tons and tons of albums. Mm. Um, that came retroactively, right? after Metallica had the Black Album. Well, actually, uh, I haven't checked the, the certification. My memory of Master of Puppets is it didn't sell huge when it came out, but they toured that album multiple times around the world for years and years. It just beat it into people's minds, uh, and it became this big thing and, and helped support their success. So I think that there was the scene building up around it that was pushing out the traditional metal bands which were now kind of middle of the road. You had glam and you had extreme, and then the traditional bands in the middle, there wasn't a lot of space for them anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely, um, I think Dio is a concert act um, after the um, the Dream Evil album definitely um, had a bit of a, a dive in popularity. Um, you know, he was going from arenas into theaters and um, that definitely went down the, um, down the gurgler for a while. But yeah. one thing I'm amazed about Iron Maiden is the the rise, the fall, and the rise again, because arguably they're the, the biggest heavy metal band in the world. Right. And Reed, when you go to an Iron Maiden show, they're one of the few bands that have a cross-generational audience. So you'll see um, fathers bring their sons it's got a it's got a young audience and you compare it to something like a Judas Priest where they don't quite have that cross-generational audience it's sort of the older it might have a bit of a younger audience but it doesn't have the audience that um, Iron Maiden has and I think the big factor in the Iron Maiden and the drive is their their manager they had a manager that looked under every rock and every ashtray to make sure that he could push the band and market them as hard as he could and I think it's it's a really great test study just to see how the band when Brute Stickinson came back from his solo career and did the, the you know the second stint as a lead singer, how that band has expanded. And you know what they did? They went into territories that a lot of metal bands right. did not play. India, um, Southeast Asia, um, South America. Yeah, I mean, broadening the audience base and even America um, you know I take a I, I look at all the sites and take an interest they seem you know they sell out the long um, the arenas Madison Square Gardens um, they are arguably more popular than they were in the 80s 
Absolutely. They, because they've again, got that small, small wood as the manager has really just pushed them and pushed them hard. Choosing to spend most of the 90s outside of the U.S. was such a smart move on their part uh, because there were still places, especially, as they say, emerging markets that were hungry for heavy metal. And yep. then Iron Maiden was there. And they still, anybody who asks me, should I go see Iron Maiden? I'm like, yes. Now, I don't need to see Iron Maiden anymore because tickets are north of 100 bucks. And I'm like, I've seen them eight times. And I don't know that I want to throw 100 bucks down at it anymore. I may go the next time they come to town. Who knows? But um, all of that, Peter, is an accidental fantastic segue into my number one pick because it's on Bruce Dickinson's comeback album, Brave New World. And it is the lead off track, The Wicker Man. Now, well this is another, good... uh, another Adrian Smith composition, and it's stylistically similar to Two Minutes to Midnight. Let's just be honest about that. But I think it's an upgraded, more mature version of that song uh, with vastly different lyrical content, of course. But again, after, after X Factor and Virtual Eleven, I thought, you know, Iron Maiden's done two albums that I'm not fond of with Bruce. Bruce leaves. They do an album I hated. Didn't even bother with the next one. A co-worker of mine, of all things, told me, hey, Bruce is back with the band. And I went, yeah. But you know what? I loved Bruce's solo career. I love Bruce's solo career. I could talk about it for hours. So I bought Brave New World regardless. Mm. And when I heard those first just three notes, it, mm. I was like, oh, I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a that's a great choice. Well done. Right. Well, my number one is um, off Number of the Beast, and it is Number of the Beast. Oh. So in Australia, um, in you know, I was in high school in the early eighties. You, if you were look into hard rock, you had ACDC, pub rock, boogie rock. But when Iron Maiden brought out that number of the beast album which they toured behind and a lot of acts from the northern hemisphere didn't even worry about australia because it's a small market small cult audience they actually came um twice in the 80s and that's why um iron maiden are fondly um regarded in um in australia because they actually cared because there's a lot of those acts of the northern hemisphere they didn't bother with australia until they were like in their 50s and 60s and well past their peak but that album that had an influence where you know kids at school would be talking about it in class have you heard this new band called iron maiden and it was just word of mouth and pow you put that album on it was great and just a different style of music it was fast it was furious and reed i tell you what the playing on that album um they've got fire in the belly and it goes back to the the groove and the swing of clive burr and and just you know the whole composition i like the um the number of the beast i think it's one of the best composed songs on that album um i like the horror of stephen king nature of it and you know the um the spoken word introduction that always adds a little bit of um sort of a little bit of flavor to it um yeah number of the beast i think that um that really cut a swathe um, and had an impression on a, on a teenage uh, Peter and um, a lot of my mates. And um, that's my number one number of the beast. Awesome. Right. So do you have any honorable mentions that you want to throw into the mix? Oh man, I could do so many. Um, just a couple. But, yeah. Just uh, off, so off. Uh, peace of mind. I actually love some of the deep tracks. I love revelations. I love, um, oh, oh my gosh, the, shoot, The Drowning Pool? It's the song about where the guy looks into the pool and there's a spirit in him that convinces him to drown himself. I can't believe, sorry, kids, I'm old and my brain doesn't work. Um, whatever, the that song, <laughs> whatever that song is called, I love that song. Yep. So, but they'd also have... The worst song Iron Maiden ever recorded. Uh, I, really think, I, I know where you're going. I know where you're going. I hate that song. I hate that song so much. In the days where dinosaurs ruled the earth. You know, and you, you have to remember the book Quest for Fire was huge. And there was a movie Quest for Fire, which was mm -hmm. not huge. So it was topical. It's just so clumsy. 
Yeah. That, that, that song is so artless and clumsy, and they got much better at, at uh, literary adaptations later on in life. Absolutely. Look, I, I've said that in a few um, previous shows, so I've got nothing more to add about that song. And uh, it probably prevents it in my book being a 10 out of 10 because of that one song. Yeah. Um, my honourable mentions, um, I was listening to the Book of Soul and a song I really like, and I think it's got great lyrics, is Tears of a Clown. And it's about Robin Williams and his battle with mental illness. And um, I think it's a really poignant, beautifully written song. The compositions, the guitar work, and it's actually a surprising topic that you'd find on an Iron Maiden album. Um, I know there's been some other... Um, shows uh, on the on the web that have actually bagged that song and said oh it's a misstep and it's a bit awkward but no i disagree i think it's a really good song and probably that one of the highlights on the book of souls uh tears of a clown yeah oh i remember what i was going to say about two minutes to midnight two minutes to midnight is literally the song that made me start paying attention to lyrics and it's because a friend of mine came up and, and we were chatting about stuff. Now I was in high school. So you have chats about music. I know now that I'm old, I'm having chats about mm. music again. But, um, and he told me, man, Iron Maiden writes such great lyrics. And, and I instantly went, it's a heavy metal band. How good can their lyrics be? And he looks at me and he goes, no, dude, I'm completely serious. Now it wasn't super easy to find lyrics in the eighties, but went to the grocery store, picked up a copy of, I don't know, Hit Parader, probably, uh, and was able to find the, the lyrics to that song. And I went, oh, yeah, all right. This, this song has something to say. And that is the song which made me start paying attention to lyrics in my music. Absolutely. Um, another thing I wanted to add is why Iron Man is so successful is merchandising, great band logo, and Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> What a, what a great mascot. Um, yeah, so I think that they had all the moving parts in place for the band right from 1980. Because you know that Iron Maiden album that went to, I think, three or four in the UK charts. So it, they were pretty successful right off the bat. And, you yeah. know, just to see, I just think, you know, with the imagery, the album covers, the merchandising, um, the, the mascot, um, you had all the ingredients for a great, you know, a fine, fine heavy metal band. And even with some, you know, I know they've had some members come and go, but the fact is they've remained relatively stable for a long time. Well, and now they've been stable for uh, more than, I mean, 30 years. Well, not 30 years, 25 years. Mm. So that's a long time. Uh, and you look at, uh, again, the comparison with Judas Priest. Let's, again, I, I don't want to be ageist, but Judas Priest is 10 years older than Iron Maiden. So you look at Judas Priest and they've got one original member. Rob Halford's not even an original member. Yes, so that's correct. The bass player is an original Daniel. member. Yep. And everybody else is a replacement. Rob is the second longest serving member. And mm. then they've got young guns as guitar players. Yep. Yep. So, you know, and, uh, there's that feeling that it's not really Judas Priest. And, and I, I think, know it's probably controversial to somebody. Oh, look, absolutely. And I think they're very focused too. They're very much in the business. You don't hear a lot of substance abuse stories. I mean, I'm sure that the band mm -hmm. has had um, some journeys with the dark side of the rock and roll lifestyle. But in general, I think with Iron Maiden, they haven't had that history with other bands where you've had band members fall off the wagon and go into sort of drug abuse, alcohol um, abuse, and, and you know, which affects your performance, which affects the band. I think they've been quite stable. And that's why I think as a unit, they were very focused on the bigger picture. And Steve Harris, um, when you look at the band leader, it all comes back to him. He is Iron Maiden. He's the driver. And I think he had a, a very um, singular vision that, um, of what the, the sound of the band should be, what the band should be, and um, combine with the manager, um, you know, to conquer the world and, and, and to spread the, the world of Iron Maiden. And they're very much a community too. So you've got the Kiss Army, right? You go to a concert, um, you feel like you're part of a community. You feel like you're in a soccer crowd, like what you're wearing at the moment, you're wearing a, a soccer jersey, which is fantastic. Um, you see a lot of people, you know, thumbs up, smiling, 
it's just a great communion. You're like in the Church of Iron Maiden. And, um, you know, every time I see an Iron Maiden show, I come out and I've got a smile on my face and you just feel like you've experienced a, a really good show and you're just in the communion of like-minded souls. Yeah. And I have never seen Iron Maiden put on a bad performance. I'm sure they have bad nights. I have, oh, pardon me. Well, guess it's not going to happen. Sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze there. No, um, probably have, more bad night. I mean, their bad night would be better than a lot of good, you know, right. some bands' good nights, you know what I'm saying. So, you know, they will probably continue to be one of, and I still support them. I'll buy everything they put out, uh, maybe yep. not all the live albums. I, I don't listen to live albums as much as I used to because, well, we could talk about that for a long time too. But, um yeah. I'll buy their new CDs as long as they keep making them. And uh, I hope they're able to do it for at least at this same level. Cause they can, you know, the Rolling Stones have proven you can rock in your eighties, yeah. but you can't rock with the same intensity. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how many more years they can do it at the level they're doing it at. Absolutely. Well, hopefully COVID per- permitting, um, they will tour in 2022, 2023 and get to um, do all the territories. Thanks, Reed. That was a um, really good show, uh, top five. Um, viewers, tell me what you think. What are your favourite um, Iron Maiden um, songs? Do you agree with us? Do you disagree? Please subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation. Plenty of more stuff coming soon, and um, we'll see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>